Hey, look at me. Now look at you. Now back to me. It may be you again. Do you ever wonder what you are or what I am? Your body seems so intact as one thing working together, but I'm here to tell you that's not the case and to answer the question about what makes you, you. So let's begin. Let's start with cells. No, not that. Not that one either. I don't, what even, I don't even know what that is. I'm talking about these mamas right here, cells. The basic unit of any living creature, from bacteria to trees to grass to cats and dogs or birds, and even you. You're made of something around 35 trillion cells. Now I want to put that into perspective. Now let's say we had 35 trillion pennies, and we stacked them on top of each other. How tall would that be? A penny is about 1.5 millimeters, and you can multiply that by 35 trillion, and boom, you get 52 billion 500 million meters, which for my standard system homies is around 172 trillion feet, or roughly 33,000 miles. Now 33,000 miles is, that means kind of nothing, so what is that? That's 1.3 trips around the equator, just over 1,259 marathons, and 12.3 trips across America, back and forth. All of this is to say, if you had the same amount of pennies as cells in your bodies, you'd be filthy rich. And of course, your body is immensely complex, and it's not just one thing, but trillions of parts working together to make you move. Sing, love, cry, and most importantly, eat. So let's look at these small scale cells, seeing what they are, and then you'll see what you are made of. Cells are filled with a liquid called cytosol, which is derived from, you can see, cyto meaning cells, and sol meaning solution. Within the cytosol, there are little compartments that make the cell work, and these are your organelles. Now let's say a cell is a little singular factory. These organelles make up your machinery, and they're the locations where important jobs get done. So let's take a look at some of the most important organelles that make the cell work. First, let's start with the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. We all know to do anything, we need energy, and your cells, again being the building blocks that make you, are no different. The mitochondria is the location where most of the energy your cell and your body needs is made. Next, we have the ribosomes, which help to make the proteins in your body. Proteins carry out almost all the functions in your body from breaking down food to helping your muscles move, so they are extremely important and making them is also then very important. Keep tuned as next week we'll talk more about these, these ribosomes and how proteins are made. We also have the endoplasmic reticulum. Now there are two versions of these bad boys the rough endoplasmic reticulum and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. We'll now say rough ER and smooth ER for short because I don't have a lot of breath. Now what are the differences? First, rough ER looks like sheets, while the smooth ER looks like a bunch of tubes. Now what makes the rough ER rough? Well, first off, it ate a bunch of nails for breakfast, it was raised on the streets, has a love mom tattoo, and it's also studded with the previously mentioned ribosomes. And smooth ER has none, making it smooth. Both of these organelles also help to transport proteins and lipids around the cell, which makes them extremely important for any function that the cell undertakes. There are also lysosomes. There are little compartments that'll trap any sort of chemical and break it down. Think of it like a trash collector for the cell. Furthermore, we have the Golgi body. Think of this as the mailman for the cell. It helps package and transport things like chemicals or proteins out of the cell. Last but not least, as there are other organelles that are very important, we can talk about the nucleus. If your cell had a brain, it would be the nucleus. Within the nucleus is the most important chemical in your body, DNA. We'll talk about this in a second, so stay tuned. Your nucleus contains DNA and has pores on the outer walls of it. This allows molecules to enter and leave to interact with DNA and other parts of the nucleus. In a nutshell, that is your cell. Now there are so many other things that go into the cell, and we'll talk about those in later videos, and I encourage you to look into them on your own too. Now let's return to the nucleus, and more importantly, to the most important molecule for life, DNA. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, holds all the information about your body, from your eye color to your height and muscular structure, even the length of your tongue. This is why DNA is so important. It is the code that creates everything about you. In later videos, we will talk about how we get our DNA, but for now, just know that it comes from your biological mother and father. Now let's pull out our imaginary microscopes and take a look at this information-filled molecule. DNA has two strands, or sides, that are wrapped around each other in what is called a double helix. A good way to think about this shape is if you had a ladder and you twisted it. Now let's unwind this structure and look at it. 
DNA can be broken down into simple units known as nucleotides. The nucleotide has a base, the part where the information is stored, and a deoxyribose phosphate backbone, the part that provides stability to the molecule. Let's start with the backbone. The sides of the DNA, or the backbone, is made of deoxyribose. In order to understand how people talk about DNA, it's important to see the carbons on this deoxyribose. Often people will discuss the direction of DNA via the backbone and the two carbons that contain binding groups. You'll hear 3' end and 5' end all the time when discussing the direction of DNA. If we take a look at the deoxyribose, we can see where this nomenclature comes from. If you start numbering the carbons from right to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, we can see where the 3 and 5 carbons are, and these are your 3' prime and 5' prime ends. These classy carbon chaps are important because they are the carbons that have side chains that are responsible for binding the deoxyribose with another deoxyribose molecule to start forming the structure of DNA and give the molecule its stability. However, first, a phosphate group, which looks like this, is needed for assistance in binding. The phosphate group will bind to the 5' prime end of the deoxyribose. This will make it so it can bind to the 3' prime end of another deoxyribose. We can now see the OH group, known as a hydroxyl group, on the 3' prime end binds well with the phosphate group attached to the 5' prime end of another deoxyribose. This is known as a condensation reaction, as an OH from the 5' prime group is lost and takes a hydrogen from the OH of a 3' prime carbon, meaning that water is released every time two deoxyribose bind together, hence the name condensation reaction. This bond between phosphate is known as a phosphodiester bond. Now if we go back to the ladder analogy, each rung of the ladder is supported by the binding of the deoxyribose to another deoxyribose. So far we've only discussed the backbone of DNA. Now let's talk about what makes DNA so magical, the information part, or the bases. The bases are split into two groups, pyrimidines and purines. In DNA we have four different bases, two pyrimidines and two purines. The pyrimidines have a singular circular structure and include the bases thymine and cytosine, C and T for short. Purines have a double circular structure and include the bases adenine and guanine, A and G for short. Now that we have our four bases, let me highlight how these pair together. The pyrimidines and purines work in complement with each other. More specifically, A, adenine, will always bind to T, thymine, and C, cytosine, will bind with G, guanine, and vice versa, of course. We call these units base pairs. The first thing to notice about base pairs is that the smaller singular circular base is always paired with a bigger double circular base. The effect of this is to keep the two chains at a fixed distance from each other all the way along the DNA molecule. Now I'm sure you are wondering, but why does it always have to be A to T and C to G? This is because these pairs form very effective hydrogen bonds, which is to say this makes the molecule the most stable. Hydrogen bonds and bond energy is something we'll discuss in a couple weeks, so look out for that video. Well, we've done it. We can take a step back from our work and look at the beautiful molecule we have built and all of its information-filled glory. Oh, information. I'm sure you're still wondering what this has to do with DNA. How does DNA lead to, let's say, your eye color or your hair length or anything like that? Well, watch our video next week done by the amazing Alan, and you'll find out more. However, in the meantime, we can look at the cell and DNA molecule and appreciate some of the building blocks that make you you and make me me. Until next time, folks, it's been a pleasure and stay tuned with Stanford Bio.